The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So I welcome uh, comments or questions at any point during this talk. We have an hour and a half, and I have only 50 slides, so <laughs> we should be OK. So um, <coughs> this, this is joint work with uh, Jim Ming Yu, who is a colleague of mine in my group at Morgan Stanley. I head up the global market modeling team at Morgan Stanley. It's a group of about 70 PhDs, mostly, spread around the world. Um, there's about 30 of us in New York, um, some in London, quite a few in Budapest, and a few in Beijing. The title of this talk is Can We Recover? And um, it's um, meant as a triple entendre. <laughs> so uh, it could refer to either the systemic risk arising from the credit crisis or the main result in a recent paper by a professor here at MIT named Steve Ross in the Sloan School. Or it could actually be uh, ac the academic and practitioner reaction to <laughs> this result. So, um, so it's really about two and three. <laughs> so uh, so um, not about can we recover from the crisis. And um, so um, there's a professor at Sloan School named Stephen Ross, and he's um, very well known in academic finance. Uh, so uh, your professor was kind enough to mention that I won Financial Engineer of the Year, and that was uh, two years ago. Uh, I was like the 20th winner. <laughs> he was the second <laughs> winner. So, uh, so anyway, uh, the, um, and, um, the first winner was another MIT professor, uh, Bob Merton. So, um, so anyway, the, um, he wrote a paper a couple years ago, and it's only now about to be published. So it takes, this is like typical in academic circles. It takes a long time for a paper to come out. And um, this paper is coming out in Journal of Finance. That's what JF stands for. And uh, Journal of Finance is the main uh, journal for the academic finance community. And um, the title of the paper is The Recovery Theorem. And that's also the title of the Theorem 1 in his paper. And that theorem one will go over, and it gives a sufficient set of conditions under which what Professor Ross calls natural probabilities at a point in time can be determined from, okay, mathematically, from exact knowledge of area de Bruce security prices, which you probably don't know what they are, but less mathematically, we'll just say from market prices of derivatives. Okay, so derivatives you've heard of, I'm sure, things like options, for example, on stocks or stock indices, could be on currencies. So the imagine that you look at Bloomberg, Bloomberg publishes a whole bunch of prices, and the idea is that you take this information, and from it, you're learning what the market believes are the probabilities of the future, concerning the future. And... Um, so if the option is on S&P 500 stock index, then you're learning from options prices what the market believes are the likelihoods of various possible levels for the S&P 500. Okay? And um, <coughs> so you, um, so we take these, this information on Bloomberg, and truth be told, we use it along with some assumptions to extract these implied market probabilities. Okay, so I want to tell you what those assumptions are. And um, so the the actual output of this analysis is a probability transition matrix, or if you do it in continuous time, you call it a in continuous state space. It, it, you'd call it a transition probability density function. <clears throat> so, the key word there is transition, and what transition means is you're getting not only the probabilities of going from, say, a, the current S&P level to any one of several levels, but even 
the probabilities of going from some other level than we're presently at today to, those, to that range of levels. So you can answer the question. So you can say, for example, the market believes that given that we're here now with S&P at, say, 1,500, that um, the probability of more than doubling is um, one half, okay, for example. Okay, I mean, which, is, which would be really high, but you know, I'm just <laughs> picking numbers randomly here. And, um, and you can even say that if S&P were to drop instantaneously to half its level, that the probability of more than doubling from there is, say, one third. Okay, so, so you can <coughs> answer questions like that. That's the output of this type of thinking. So there'll be th three probability measures that we can be thinking about. And we'll call them P, Q, and R. And I'd like to tell you what each of them means. So P stands for physical probability measure. So the P is for physical. And um, think of that as the actual objective reality <laughs> of, future s of future states for, say, S&P 500. So, so, like, let's say, you know, God knows that, for example, um, the probability that S&P is up by the end of the year is one half. And uh, we, <laughs> unfortunately, not being God, <laughs> don't know that. But let's say the, the philosophy is that there is some sort of true probability of S&P being up at the end of the year. And, and um, I used, let's say, I used a half. Um, maybe it's 60 percent. If it is 60 percent, then the probability of S&P being down at the end of the year is 40 percent. And um, the uh, point is, is P is meant to indicate the kind of the frequencies with which S&P 500, in my example, takes on various values. Now. There's another probability measure that people in derivatives spend a lot of time working with, and that's called risk-neutral probability measure. And it's often denoted by a letter Q, so we'll denote it by Q. And um, the concept of a risk-neutral probability measure was also actually proposed by Steve Ross many years ago. And um, it's, a, um, it's called risk-neutral because um, you, uh, when you're working with it, if you think about how fast prices appreciate over time, then they grow randomly. But on average, under this risk-neutral measure Q, they grow at the same rate as your bank balance would grow. Okay, so um, so your bank balance, let's say, nowadays is growing at best at the rate of one percent. <laughs> okay, and um, when you look at how fast, historically, stocks have grown, it's actually much higher, on average, than 1%. It's more like about 9. So we would call the difference between 9% and, and 1%, we call that 8% differential risk premium. And um, um, let me just pretend there's no dividends to keep life simple when I, go th when I say this. So, so the, um, now, um, this risk-neutral measure is kind of a fictitious probability measure in the sense that it's not describing the actual probabilities or frequencies of, of transitions. It's more a device or a tool or a trick uh, that, that's handy. And one of its properties that causes it to earn the name risk-neutral probability measure is that uh, when you look at how fast, say, S&P grows on average under this risk-neutral probability measure Q, it would be growing nowadays at 1%, okay? So the same as your money market, as your bank balance is growing at. So, so the, the word risk-neutral is meant to indicate that, that the growth rate under this measure is consistent with investors in the economy being risk neutral, meaning that they require no premium for bearing risk. Okay? <clears throat> now, there's a third probability measure that we're going to be talking about today, 
that actually you won't find any literature on. Uh, and we're going to call it R, since we've already, you know, seems like a natural <laughs> letter to pick, having already gone through P and Q. And um, the um, R measure, you can think of the R as standing for recovered probability measure. And it's going to be the probability measure that we get from market prices, as I was talking about earlier. And um, the, uh, the operational meaning of this R measure is it's capturing the market's beliefs regarding the future. But we allow for the possibility that the market could be wrong. So, um, so if we were applying this to, say, houses and housing prices in, say, 2005, it may well be that if we looked at Bloomberg and got prices of mortgage-backed securities, that we would extract an R probability measure that says housing prices are going to continue on their you know, incessant upward trajectory. <laughs> and uh, you know, we're going to keep growing at the rate of, say, 15% a year uh, each year for the next 10 years, okay, for something like that. So, um, you know, that could be what the market's beliefs were, you know, back in 2005. And we know now that those beliefs were wrong, if, if that was what, what the market was inferring, okay? So, so I want to allow for at least the theoretical possibility that the market could be wrong, okay? And so that's why I'm drawing a distinction, let's say, between the R probability measure that captures the market's beliefs and the P probability measure that captures physical reality. Okay? So now there's a lot of people in finance who simply cannot accept the, you know, the possibility that the market could be wrong. <laughs> and um, for those people, the sort of true believers in market efficiency, they're free to set R to P every time they see an R. But I want to um, allow for the possibility that what we recover is not physical probabilities, but simply the market beliefs. Okay? <clears throat> And anyway, it's kind of semantic. It's good semantics if the probability measure we recover is the one Ross uh, <laughs> uh, said we uh, should get. <laughs> R stands for Ross. OK, so, so, the, um, so Ross calls the probability measure that we recover, he calls them natural probability measures. And um, well, let's say that suggests that the risk-neutral probability measures are unnatural, which um, I think is fair, actually. Because uh, when you hear the word probability, you tend to think about frequencies with which events occur. And the risk-neutral probability measures do not give you the frequencies with which events occur. What the risk-neutral probability measures give you is instead uh, prices of so-called aero de Bruce securities. So let me give you a sense of what that means. So say I tell you that the risk-neutral probability of S&P 500 being up at the end of the year is 40%. Um, then how should you interpret that? Well, you should simply interpret it as this. Imagine that you can agree now to buy a security that pays $1 just if S&P 500 is up at the end of the year. And um, usually when you and I buy things, we buy them in a spot market. So we pay now for pay now for things. But sometimes your credit is good, <laughs> and you can actually agree now to pay later. Okay, so, so we're going to be thinking that you're agreeing now to pay later some fixed amount in return for this security that's going to pay you $1 just if S&P 500 is up at the end of the year. And if I tell you that the risk neutral probability of S&P 500 being up by the end of the year is 40 cents, wh what that means financially is that you agree now to pay 40 cents at the end of the year for this security. Okay. <clears throat> so you can imagine there'd be another security that pays a dollar just if S&P 500 is down by the end of the year. And um, the only possible price that that security could have in an arbitrage free world would be 60 cents. Because um, if you were to buy both securities, then you'd have paid a total of 40 cents and 60 cents. So you're agreeing now to pay a dollar at the end of the year. 
And then having both securities, either the S&P is up or S&P is down, and so you'll collect one dollar from one of them and not the other. So, um, so if, for example, the, f the one paying if S&P is up costs 40 cents, while the one paying if S&P is down only costs 50 cents, then there would be an arbitrage, which would be to buy both securities, pay only agree now to pay 90 cents, and then get a dollar for sure at the end of the period. So it'd be up 10 cents by the end of the year. Question? These are similar to digital options. Yes, okay. they're uh, it's, it's more than similar. They are digital options. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, <coughs> so so that's right. So that's another term which I actually use on the next slide. So that's that's exactly right. So you know, digital options is just too good a term, so economists, in order to obfuscate and look smart, call them error de Bruce securities. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, <clears throat> okay. Um, so, continuing with the obfuscation, uh, I want to tell you about a world with a representative agent. So, um, the, um, so the, there's this, so economists are fond of, of trying to formally model the market. Okay, so I think you know you read the newspaper every day. You'll read something like market thought that um, you know stocks are no longer a good investment, so there was a sell-off. Um, you know, um, market is a nice short word to capture what people are thinking, and so economists, rather than say the market, will say there's a world with a representative agent. So this representative agent is a fictitious investor who. Um, who has all the mathematical properties that we give an investor, such as a utility function and an endowment and so on. And um, what makes this particular investor a representative agent is that this agent sort of finds that current prices are such that it's optimal to um, hold exactly what's available in the amount that is available. Okay, so um, so let's say um, if if what's on offer is uh, you know let's say uh, some Google shares and some Apple shares and some IBM shares and and um, and if we take the uh, the total market cap of Google, total market cap of Apple, total market cap of IBM, uh, and let's say Apple's biggest. I think I don't know. I I don't actually know whether Google's bigger or IBM, but let's say it's Google, <laughs> and then IBM. Um, the um, so let's just say Apple's biggest, then Google, then IBM. Well, this investor would actually find that it's it's optimal for him to have mo most of his money in Apple, second most amount of his money in Google, third most amount of his money in IBM. That's the representative agent. Okay, so he, he's be he's acting in the way the whole economy is acting. Okay. Well, um, I, I've been working in Wall Street now since 1996. I have yet to hear a trader tell me about a representative agent. And uh, so, um, so anyway, so although I understand what the words mean uh, and even the math, uh, I wanted to present this material in a way that, let's say, at least quantitative traders could understand it. So, um, so I tried to get away from representative agents. and. Um, and present these ideas in the language that uh, at least quants on Wall Street are familiar with. So, um, so, uh, so oh, I won't be talking about a representative agent, and I will be talking instead about something that's probably not too familiar to you, but at least quants have heard of, and that would be something called numerator portfolio. And it also goes by other names. Another name is growth optimal portfolio. And it even has a third name, which is called natural numerator. And these are three different phrases that all describe the same mathematical object. And this mathematical object is a portfolio. And more precisely, it's the value of a portfolio that has some nice properties. So the growth optimal portfolio indicates one of its properties. Uh, this portfolio has a very nice property, which is that in the long run, meaning over an infinite horizon, the uh, growth rate 
of this portfolio is first of all random, but second, if you take the mean of that random growth rate, that mean is actually the largest possible among all portfolios. Okay, so, um, so starting with Kelly in 1956, uh, this particular portfolio with the largest mean growth rate over an infinite horizon has, you know, has, let's say, received a lot of attention. Um, it's actually quite humorous, <laughs> some of this attention that it's received. Uh, so Kelly was a physicist who worked at Bell Labs, and um, he was actually um, a colleague of Shannon's at Bell Labs. Uh, so Shannon did his seminal work at Bell Labs, but actually came here after that. And, um, and well, you know, his ideas in, uh, really caught on, and um, especially, and I'd say started the field of information science, we'll call it, whatever. And um, let's say, but Kelly was applying these ideas to finance, and certain financial economists were less than enthused about the application of information theory to finance. So in particular, there was a financial economist here named Paul Samuelson who was a, who championed, I guess, the opposition to, to this Kelly um, criterion, it's called. And uh, so I'll just tell you a short story. So, um, you, yeah. If I could just yeah, sure. We had mentioned in an earlier class uh, the book Fortune's Formula. Yes. And this book goes into a lot of background and storytelling about this whole era and exchanges. So anyway. That's true. Know, just it's a fantastic moment, please, book. Uh, uh, I've read it. That. I loved it. Uh, it's, uh, especially if you're at MIT, you should definitely read this book because uh, it talks about a lot of MIT professors, and um, some of whom are still here, like Bob Merton. And um, so... Uh, it's a it's a quick easy read. You don't you don't even have to have a background in finance to really enjoy it. So, <coughs> uh, so, uh, so it, there's a you can read about uh, the story I'm going to tell you now in that book. Uh, so the story is uh, Samuelson grew a little tired, I guess, of trying to explain to these dumb information theorists that this Kelly criterion was not so great. So he published an article in a journal called Journal of Banking and Finance. That's actually a finance journal. Uh, where he explained why it wasn't necessarily such a good idea to hold this portfolio. And in this article, every word he used was of one syllable, except the very last word of the article, <laughs> where he managed to say that he has... I, don't, I can't even do it in one syllable, but anyway. Uh, he has, okay, so just ignore my multi-syllabic words, but anyway, he says, uh, I have managed to write an uh, a article that ends with all words with just one syllable, except for the, uh, okay, except for the, this last syllable or something like that. Okay, I, I lost it, sorry. But anyway, the last word in this thing was syllable itself, <laughs> which is multi-syllabic, or multi whatever. So, uh, okay, so anyway. It was kind of insane. So, so let's move on. So this talk, it has six parts, and uh, we have an hour to go. So let's say we'll try to spend 10 minutes on each. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's a good question. So it does have risk, first of all. It does have a lot of risk. Um, let's say. Um, it's not the riskiest, though. Uh, so um, some risk does not carry with it expected return. Uh, and so that's why um, it's not the riskiest. But it's risky. So, so Samuelson's objections were precisely what you're getting at, that this is a fairly risky strategy. And uh, so it's, I'm glad you brought that up. Okay. <coughs> Okay, so there's six parts of the talk. I'm going to go over what error debris security prices are. So again, they're digital options prices and uh, their connection to market beliefs. Uh, I'll talk about this Ross recovery theorem. So when, in Ross's paper, which you can get on SSRN, uh, he does everything in a setting that's, um, that's called finite state Markov chains. 
And so that's mathematically simpler than um, what we use in practice. And um, you know, I totally agree that when you try to introduce something, you do it in the simplest mathematical setting. So now that he's done that, I wanted to do it in a more familiar setting, uh, which is a diffusion setting. Okay, so that's a, a diffusion has an uncountably infinite number of states. And I still want to keep things as simple as possible while going beyond finite state Markov chains, so I work in a univariate diffusion setting. So there's only one source of uncertainty, which is the same as in ROS. And um, uh, our technique is um, to get these results is based on something called change of numeraire. So a numeraire is a technical term, actually, that describes an asset whose value is always positive. So um, there are securities whose values can have either sign. So swaps are a classical example. <laughs> so a swap is a security which at inception has zero value, actually. And then the moment after inception, the world changes, and the swap value either becomes positive or becomes negative. And um, so, so a swap it would not be eligible to be a numerator because of that property that its value is real. Uh, on the other hand, if you take a stock, its price is always positive. Um, well, that's debatable. <laughs> so actually, so let's say, um, so let's say, um, let's not do a stock. Let's do a uh, treasury bond. <laughs> a treasury bond, uh, U.S. treasury bond, its price is always positive. Um, the, the reason I want to shy away from stocks is because if you take Lehman Brothers stock, for example, its price was positive, then became zero. And actually, because Lehman's price became zero, Lehman's share could not be a numerator. So when I say that the numerator value has to be positive, I mean strictly positive. Okay. And um, so, um, so anyway, there's this literature about how to change numerators, how to go from one asset with positive value to another asset with positive value. And um, it's uh, useful for understanding how this Ross recovery works. So um, we apply it uh, when we have uh, a so-called time homogeneous diffusion. I'll tell you what that means. Uh, over a bounded state space. So bounded state space means that the uh, set of values that the diffusion can take is in some finite interval. So, um, so if you're thinking about the uncertainty being, for example, S&P 500, then the natural lower bound for S&P 500 would be zero. And you have to accept that there's a finite upper bound in order to apply our results. Now, you know, personally, I have no problem saying that S&P 500 is bounded above by 20 trillion. <laughs> okay, but um, some economists have actually said uh, this is ridiculous. Uh, you know, and challenged my work and stuff like that for for uh, for that assumption. So, so anyway, so because of those challenges, I have actually been uh, trying to extend our work to an unbounded state space where the you know let's say the largest possible value for S&P 500 would be infinity. And um, I found, actually, that it's not that easy. And so, um, so sometimes I can make it work, and sometimes I cannot. So I'll, when we get there, I'll explain some examples that work and some examples that don't. So this, this last section is kind of incomplete, the sixth section. And so basically, I've got examples that fail, examples that succeed, but I don't have a general theory. So. Um, there'll be different assumptions in different parts of the talk, but within a section, there's only one set of assumptions operating. Yeah. So bounded state, that the value of anything is always bounded by yeah. the by the fact that the universe. I know you're going to say that. <laughs> so <laughs> that's been my response too. So uh, the universe is bounded, and it's growing, but it's bounded. So um, so uh, so. Uh, so I agree. I mean, you know, so I'm on your side on this. I'm just telling you what I've been told. Uh, yeah. So I'm working on it anyway, just so they can shut up. <laughs> but uh, anyway. Actually, can I ask a comment yeah. on the issue of the numerator? I don't know. But you'll tell tell me how connected this is, but with uh, the Kelly criterion, mm -hmm. um, you know, the or one of the origins of that is if you're going to if you have a, f a gambling opportunity where where it's favorable. How much of your bankroll should you bet mm -hmm. on that 
gamble. And um, the, uh, basically, the Kelly criterion tells you what proportion of your bankroll you should invest at all times. You should never bet everything. And if you do bet everything, you lose everything. Yeah. And you're done. So, yeah. so um, the issue with the numeraire portfolio and or never being able to go down to zero in the sense that it's yeah. you can never go bankrupt. And That's true. And, and so uh, assumptions yeah. that of uh, you know, being able to always rebalance your portfolio. Uh, yeah. So this just give you a, a flavor of what this numeraire portfolio is. It's, uh, you have, um, you're, you're betting a constant fraction of your wealth in every security. So, um, so, so let's just keep it simple. There's, there's only two securities. Uh, one is risky and the other is riskless. And um, so you might be betting, putting 40% of your wealth in the risky one and 60% then in the riskless one. And um, that's when you start. So you have $100 and you put 40 in the risky one and 60 in the riskless one. And um, then time moves forward. And let's say the price of the risky one changes. Then um, when you revalue using the new price, it's unlikely that 40% of your wealth is in the risky one. So, um, so in fact, if the price went up of the risky one, you'll have more than 40% of your wealth in that risky one. So you need to sell some of that risky one. And then the money you get, you put into the riskless one. And, um, and then, so that's, and so every time the price changes, you need to trade theoretically in order to maintain a constant f fraction of 40% of your wealth invested in this risky asset. So, um, so it's, uh, so we assume zero transactions costs when we do this analysis. So because there are positive transactions costs, one, you know, one should take that into account and there is literature on how to do that. Um, <clears throat> so I won't be formally entertaining transactions cost in this talk. Uh, it's, um, there's work here at MIT actually on doing that. Uh, and um, it's hard to, like for the question of how should you invest, it feels like it's a complication that won't change anything qualitative <laughs> about it might change how frequently, it definitely changed how frequently you trade, but it wouldn't, um, let's say, it's unclear how it would change your initial investment in, across, across bets. So let's begin with part one. So we have these digital options, or also called binary options, that's another term. And um, they trade actually in FX markets, so foreign exchange. And um, they pay one unit of some currency, so say dollar, if um, an event comes true. So it might be that you're looking at dollar euro, and um, if by the end of the year dollar euro exceeds two, uh, then you get a dollar. Otherwise, you get zero. And um, <clears throat> so there would be a price in the FX markets, and it would be a spot price typically, so meaning you have to pay now for it. Um, the, uh, let's uh, let A, for arrow, be the price today uh, of such a security. And the subscripts on A are J given I. So the uh, idea is that you can think of yourself as in a finite state setting. There's various discrete levels of, say, dollar euro that we have that can be possible today. And there's also various discrete levels for dollar euro by the end of the year. And um, I indicates the state we're in. So maybe dollar euro is $2 per euro right now. And, um, and uh, J indicates the state we can go to. Maybe we can go to $3 per euro. Okay. <coughs> so, um, and, um, so, so in my example, A32 <laughs> would be the price of an area debris security given that the current dollar-euro exchange rate is $2 per euro, and it pays $1 just if dollar-euro transitions from $2 per euro to $3 per euro. <coughs> so um, now you can use 
either um, these, so the idea is we have discrete states, and let's say these are values that are possible at the end of the year. And uh, the example I just went through, you're getting $1 just if is $3 per euro at the end of the year. And um, so the height of that vertical line is 1. And um, now I'll just comment that um, this is a slightly exotic option in the sense that um, well, it's called exotic. It's slightly exotic. Um, so contra in contrast with exotics, there's this term vanilla. Okay, and it actually <laughs> indicates a flavor of ice cream. <laughs> and uh, so, um, so we have this terminology, which you get used to after a while, and you can't understand when you talk to a man on the street why they don't understand what a vanilla option is. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so a vanilla option is a payoff that um, looks like, like this. Okay, so it's a hockey stick payoff. <laughs> okay, and uh, that's, that's the payoff from a call option. And um, it turns out that there is, a pay, there is a portfolio involving options at three different strikes that can perfectly replicate the payoff to this error de Bruce security. And so here's a payoff from a single option struck at two. And um, I'll just uh, say that if I had changed the strike to say B3, then it would look like that. Now. <coughs> And so now you can combine options into a portfolio. So you could, for example, buy a call struck at two. And then you can furthermore sell two calls struck at three. <laughs> so if you sell on top of that two calls struck at three, you end up creating a portfolio that goes like this. Okay? And, um, and so it can go negative in value. <coughs> so if you not only buy one call struck at two, sell two calls struck at three, but furthermore, buy one call struck at four, <laughs> then you end up with this payoff, which is, the payoff is called a butterfly spread payoff because the picture is meant to remind you of a butterfly. <laughs> okay, and, um, and notice that if the only possible values for, for the FX rate were $1 per euro, $2 per euro, 3 or 4 or 5, if, if that were the world, then um, notice that when you form that portfolio, the only positive payoff you can get from it is $1 just if dollar euro is at 3. Okay. <coughs> so you can synthesize a butterfly. You can synthesize an area debris security using a butterfly spread. Okay. okay. <coughs> so this was pointed out many years ago. And um, so, so we really, so even if the FX market were, say, not directly giving us the prices of digital options, we could, from vanilla options, extract the implicit price of a digital. And um, so, so um, <clears throat> and what you would learn from vanilla options is, you know, what the market is charging for the digital. Given that, let's say we're presently at two dollars per euro, and um, what you would not learn from these options prices is what the price of this security will be should we today have the exchange rate change to some other value. Okay, so um, so you, but however, you can make assumptions <laughs> that, uh, as to ha what the options prices will be were today's exchange rate different. And um, so, um, so that's commonly done in practice. So, um, one th so a common assumption, for example, is that the probability of transitioning from 2 to 3, so moving up by um, half, OK? So, you know, so you're moving up by half of 2 to 3, is the same if you were at any other level. So, so for example, if you were at 4, then the probability of going to 6 would be whatever the probability is of going from 2 to 3. Okay? Because if you're at 4, then the probability going up by half of 4 to 6. 
OK, that's the assumption. So, um, OK, so that's called sticky delta. And um, it's a common assumption. So if you make that assumption, then you can take the information at just today's level. And like, let's say you know all the digitals for, from, from 2. And you can make that assumption, let's say, the um, probability of a given percentage change is invariant to the starting level. Uh, and then you can, uh, from that, figure out what the probability of going from 4, a different level than we're at today, is to all these different levels. Okay, So you can go from a, a vector bit of information that the market is giving you to a matrix. And that matrix is called transition matrix. And um, so we're going to, in this talk, assume <laughs> that somebody's made such an assumption. And so you actually know this matrix. Okay, So you actually know, if, as a starting point, what the prices are of these area debris securities or binary options starting from any level and going to any level. <coughs> so, um, OK, so, so now um, let's say I think in order to, um, to get through the, my whole talk, I'm going to skip these slides because they're kind of like just being very precise about what some terms mean that aren't going to be that important for the overall story. So, um, OK. So let's go to this slide. <coughs> and so we think of there being just a single source of uncertainty x, which could be dollar euro. And um, we imagine that we have this matrix of area debris security prices. We know every number in this matrix. And we ask, what does the market believe about transitions from any place to any place? What does the market believe is the frequency of these transitions? Now, suppose that the number that's indicating the price of the area debris security going from 2 to 3, suppose that number is, say, 0.1. Now, what does it mean? It just means that you pay 10 cents today for security paying a dollar just if you go from 2 to 3. That's all it means. Now you can ask, what is the frequency with which you go from 2 to 3? It need not be 10%. There's at least two reasons why the 10 cent price could differ from the probability of going from where you are to where you, pay, you get paid. Um, one such reason is simply time value of money. OK, so if you were to buy all the area debris securities, the one paying off in every you know, one for every state, you'll find that the total cost is less than one, even though the payoff for sure is one from the portfolio. And that's simply because of time value of money. You know, so when you put a dollar in the bank today, you actually get more than a dollar back uh, you know, when you pull out at the end of the year. And um, so and if you do the inverse problem, how much do you have to put in the bank today in order to have a dollar at the end of the year? It might be you know, 95 cents. And so, um, so that's called time value of money. And so just the fact that you have to pay now for the area to Bruce security, and you only get paid off at the end of the year, that, has, that causes this, this price of 10 cents to be, time value of money causes it to be lower. OK, so, so that's just discounting for, for time. That's just, interest rates are positive. So that's one effect. Now, there's another effect, which is called risk aversion. And um, so risk aversion is, is the thought that, um, that even if the interest rate was zero to extract from abstract away from the effect I just described, um, that it still may be the case that a 10 cent price paid for an area debris security transitioning from 2 to 3 is different from the probability of such a transition, the real world probability of such a transition. Because of, because for example, it may be 
say, quite desirable to get money in that state, in which case uh, 10 cents is over the real world probability, okay? Uh, or it could be the opposite, that maybe it's not desirable to get money in that state, in which case 10 cents is under the real world probability. So, um, so give you a concrete, more concrete example. Um, let's say, um, well, let's say that instead of something that maybe a little closer to home is, um, let's say this is S&P 500, and I know the values are very different than the numbers I've indicated here, but let's just you know forget about the actual numbers. And um, so, so the point is, is compare. Let's suppose that it's equally likely, in terms of true probabilities, to go from 2 to 3 as it is to go from 2 to 1. So we have two area debris securities. One struck at 1, the other struck at 3. And I'm telling you that it's equally likely that you go up by 1 as it is go down by 1. Uh, now, you can ask the question, does it necessarily mean that the prices of these securities that pay a dollar are the same? And the answer is no, not necessarily. And um, actually, the sort of standard thinking in financial academic circles is that for S&P 500, it would cost more to buy this area debris security than it would be than it would cost to buy that one, even though everyone agrees that it's equally likely to get paid from from them from each of them. And the reason that um, it's thought to cost more to buy this one than it is to buy that one is because this one has an insurance value. So the thinking is that, on average, people are long the stocks in the stock market. And that, that means that they're really upset when the stocks fall. And so they really like this one that ends up paying should the stock market fall from 2 to 1. Okay? Uh, whereas this one, while it's nice to get money, um, let's say you're already fairly wealthy from the fact that you're owning stocks and the stock market went up, so uh, so you you own, you know you'll pay a positive amount for this security, but not as much as you pay for this one. Okay, <clears throat> okay, so so that's called risk aversion. <clears throat> so what we want to do is go from the prices that are contaminated, let's say, by time value of money effects and by risk aversion effects, and we want to cleanse them of that <laughs> contamination and try to extract what the market believes are the frequencies of the future states. Okay? <clears throat> so I'll tell you that this was thought to be impossible before the Ross paper. And in fact, you know, without making assumptions, it is impossible. <laughs> so all Ross did is make some assumptions that are thought to be fairly mild and um, by some, <laughs> including me, and um, so he, you know, essentially, in, es in essence, showed the power of some assumptions. That's, you know, one way of thinking about it. <coughs> so, um, so again, let's denote by R the recovered probability measure, which will tell us the market beliefs about the frequencies of future states. And um, we don't know R when we start. What we do know is these error debris security prices, I'm assuming. And uh, we'll denote those by A for arrow. So, um, so, so what Ross's paper does is it says, you know A, and if you're willing to make the following assumptions, then you'll know R. So what are the assumptions? Well, before I tell you assumptions, I have to use, tell you some terminology so that you understand the assumptions. So um, he'll work with a pricing matrix A, which we've actually been going through. So that's. Um, the area debris security prices indexed by starting state and final state, which we call x is starting state, y is final state. Then there'll be the desired output from this analysis, which he calls natural probability transition matrix. So these are the market's beliefs for every starting value x and for every final value y. Then there'll be something called pricing kernel, which is literally the ratio of these area debris security prices to these uh, output natural probabilities. So if you want to get an understanding of what this pricing kernel is, you can think of it as an attempt to capture the effects from time value of money and from risk aversion. 
So it's like a norm, think of it as a normalization. You start with A, and A is actually affected by three things. It's affected by the unknown real world probabilities, or at least markets' beliefs of them. A is also affected by a second thing, which is time value of money, and A is affected by a third thing, which is risk aversion. So if we take A and divide by P, then we're normalizing for the first effect, the frequencies. And so we're left with just the combined effect from time value of money and from risk aversion. And so let's say if, if, um, if, people, if interest rate was zero and people were risk neutral, then we would actually expect A to equal P. And so this ratio would be just constant. <coughs> So, um, so Ross talks about a world with a representative investor, and um, essentially, um, this is an assumption. This equation you're seeing here, and it's a, it's, it's an assumption on the form that a function of two variables takes. So phi, first of all, is a positive function. So phi is positive as opposed to, you know, so phi cannot take negative values because both A and P are positive. And um, it's a phi is a function of two variables, x and y. And what this assumption is doing is it's saying, well, let's put structure on this function phi because it'll help us to find it if we put the structure. So this is the first sort of key assumption, actually, that um, the, the function of two variables, x and y, actually has the form on the right which for a moment just ignore the delta for a moment and then you can see that what you have on the right if you ignore delta if you think of delta as one is you have a function of y and then you have the same function of x okay so it's written in a convoluted way with this u prime and c and all that stuff but if delta is one then you have a fraction whose numerator is a function of y and whose denominator is the same function but of x okay <coughs> and um, so um, so that's a real, that's actually, in essence what that does is it reduces the dimensionality of the thing we're searching for by a lot. So we started by searching for a function phi of two variables, and we, by this assumption, reduce the search to a function of one variable, which is, say, the function in the numerator, which is the same thing as the function in the denominator. So, okay, and, well, so, so now let's bring back delta. And um, delta is a scalar here, and it's a positive scalar. And so we need to search for that as well. So in the end, we reduce the search to a function of one variable and a scalar delta. So, so the economic meaning of, of, of the, first of all, the function of one variable is it's called marginal utility. And um, it's, it's meant to indicate how much happiness you get from each additional unit of consumption. So it's um, the typical, what we think it looks like, as a function of c, this u, um, u prime, u prime as a function of c is thought to typically look like that. So it's positive, meaning every unit of consumption makes you happy. <laughs> and uh, it's actually declining, meaning uh, the first unit of consumption makes you real happy. Uh, then the next unit of consumption still brings some happiness, but not as much, and so on. Okay, So, so, <coughs> um, so that's the kind of function we're looking for. u prime as a function of c. Uh, he won't actually find u prime as a function of c. He'll find the composition of u prime with a function c of y. And um, so let's say, keep that in mind. Okay, so anyway, so then there's that delta. And that's, um, again, a positive scalar. And it's meant to capture time value of money. Um, and so that's. Like the, uh, the, the y is the um, state at the end of the period, and x is the state at the beginning of the period. And so that's why delta is associated with the numerator, not the denominator. So delta would be a number like 0.9, and that indicates how much discount you give to, um, to let's say, happiness <laughs> received in the future rather than now. OK, so OK. OK, now. Here's a quote from Ross's paper uh, that um, 
is his theorem one. That's called the recovery theorem. And um, the only thing is I changed the um, letters to conform with the letters I'm using rather than the ones he used. And that's because his choice of letters is completely unnatural to me and most people. So, uh, so, um, so I don't even want to tell you what he used. So, um, <coughs> so anyway, whereas I tried to choose letters that make sense. So, so I used A for Eric de Roux. Okay, and uh, you know, so, okay. <coughs> okay, so anyway, he says you have a world with a representative agent. So that's um, this restriction. That's actually this restriction uh, that we talked about on the last slide. And then um, he says, if the pricing matrix, which is the error debris security prices, is positive, which means that all entries in it are strictly above zero, or irreducible, which means that some entries have zeros with the rest being positive, uh, and there's some structure, which we need not get into, to where the zeros are, uh, then there exists um, a unique solution to the problem of finding, OK, he P, which is, P is actually market beliefs, and I've been calling that R in often. So, so anyway, I slipped a bit there and called it P, but so anyway, so that's market beliefs about the frequencies of future states. He'll also get as an output the delta, which is the scale or positive scale or telling you the market's time value of money. And finally, this pricing kernel, phi, which is the ratio of of um, A to P. So the point is, is that it, so, so, which you're supposed to realize, even though he didn't say it, is that as a result, um, well, okay, so he did say it actually. That you're finding P, I think that's the main thing. And um, so anyway, and so there's only one, like he's actually saying, if you make these assumptions, there's only one, surprisingly, there's only one. Uh, possible real world or market beliefs that are consistent with the data and the assumptions made. Okay, so, so <clears throat> like to give you a sense of what the importance of this result is, um, so prior to his paper, I mean, people have been interested in trying to infer from market prices what the market believes, but they always thought that you had to supply some parameters that capture market risk aversion. So, so for example, a common approach is to assume that um, you have a representative investor and that they have a particular type of utility function called constant relative risk aversion. <laughs> and there's a parameter in that utility function, and you had to specify the numerical value that parameter takes before you could do, before you could learn the market's beliefs from prices. And no one ever felt very comfortable <laughs> specifying that parameter. So what Ross essentially did is he managed to uh, essentially do the identification non-parametrically and um, where you don't have to supply any parameters. And so you essentially um, just have to buy his assumptions. You don't have to do any work <laughs> to actually uh, go from um, market prices to market beliefs. Okay, so <clears throat> um, okay, so let's get these remarks. And um, so let me, Could yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you don't have to supply, yeah. So the, the exact statement is you don't have to supply a parameter I like under, you don't, uh, that describes the amount of the market's risk aversion. Rather, you just have to, you have to accept um, this assumption, and I'll show you. This assumption about the structure of phi, OK? So if you just accept that this function of two variables is not, um, doesn't have the, f the full amount of degrees of freedom that a, an arbitrary function of two variables has. It has a reduced number of degrees of freedom implicit on the right-hand side. Okay, so let me maybe, um, remembering that x is actually just a, a vector of finite length, and so is y, then think of the left-hand side as having degrees of freedom n squared. And on the right-hand side, 
you're looking for that f the, the numerator function is just a vector of length n. And the denominator function is the same function, so same vector. And then there's also this delta. So, so let's say on the left-hand side, you're describing something that, without restriction, is of order n squared. So let's say n is 10. So it has 100 degrees of freedom. And on the right-hand side, you're describing a vector of length 10 and along with a scalar, so 11 degrees of freedom. So you, you, you have to accept that you're willing to, that okay, before you place any restriction, it's 100 degrees of freedom. Now you make the restriction, it's 11. You have to accept that. <laughs> and if you do, then he will like, uh, say that um, he'll tell you the 11 entries. That's it. So you don't have to supply anything. Okay, so I haven't told you how he'll find the right. That's probably what you're asking. How the hell did he get the 11? <laughs> okay, so I haven't shown you that. Yes. Um, just really quickly, does c change as a function of time and spot price? Or no? C is not a function of time. Okay. And to answer your question, and uh, and then the argument of c is um, is could be a price. It, it's allowed to be a price. Okay. Uh, so uh, that's how you should think of it. Okay. <clears throat> so there's a lot of time homogeneity in everything he does here. So he'll never let anything depend on time, actually. <laughs> okay. Uh, to answer your question. <clears throat> um, so I still haven't shown you how he did it. Um, and so he uses Perron Frobenius theorem. And um, I don't actually have slides on how you actually calculate <laughs> the uh, 11 entries. Um, so I, I think I just have to refer you to the paper. Um, but he, he, he relies on something called perron frobenius theorem. And um, I'm going to show you how we, my co-author and I, um, actually calculate the analog of, those, um, of that 11-dimensional unknown. Okay. So, um, so we're going to work in a continuous setting where instead of looking for a vector and a scalar, we're going to look for a function and a scalar and uh, a function of one variable. And um, <clears throat> so, so anyway, so you'll get a sense of how to do it from ours. And essentially, if you discretize what we do, you'll get what he did. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's get, forget these remarks. And let's forget these. And um, so now we'll get into some theory about changing numeraire. So this is sort of backdrop to, um, to how my co-author and I proceed. So, um, so there's, <coughs> um, so again, a numeraire is a portfolio whose value is always strictly positive. And um, there's a, a th a well-developed theory in derivatives pricing about how to change the numerator. And um, let's say um, we're going to use that theory to uh, understand what Ross did. So we start with an economy with a so-called money market account. And so that's a uh, theoretical construct that's pretty familiar to, to most of us. <laughs> and uh, it's a bank account. So, um, so we're going to be working now in continuous time. So imagine that time, which is continuous, is on this axis. And then we're sitting here today, and we put some money into the bank. And being poor, we only put $1 in. So, um, so then we ask, how will, you know, looking forward, how will this money in our bank change? Well, you know, they do still pay a positive interest rate. It's awfully small, <laughs> but it's positive. And so it'll go up, and they change the rate. Actually, you know, so now maybe it's half a percent, but next week Chase might decide to give you one percent, in which case it goes up faster, and then they might the week after give you two percent, it goes up faster, and then they might go back to half a percent. So you know, so that's one possible path for your money market account balance, and we don't know the future, so maybe you know we know how much we're getting over this first little bit of time, but they could actually decide to pay less over the second period and then more over the third, oh, something like that. Okay, so it's increasing and it's random. Okay, so that's the money market account balance. It's considered as an increasing random process. 
And uh, actually, there's nothing in the math that requires it to be increasing if some really cheap bank like Bank of America tried this actually <laughs> to charge a negative rate, <laughs> okay, uh, then it would actually go down uh, with a negative rate, but it wouldn't go negative. So it still counts as a, as a new rare. And um, so, so anyway, that's allowed as an aside. And um, <clears throat> okay, so we've got this money market account. And um, so the growth rate is called R, and that's just real valued. And then we also have risky assets. So we'll have a total of n risky assets. And um, then um, we're going to assume there's no arbitrage between the n risky assets and the one money market account. And that um, <clears throat> when we go look at, um, then the idea is that when we look at Bloomberg's prices for these n plus 1 assets, we're able to extract these area debris security prices. That's the idea. And um, let's say what I'm assuming is that uh, what we're extracting is consistent with the idea that the uncertainty uh, that's driving everything here is a diffusion, meaning that the uncertainty uh, has sample paths that are continuous, uh, but they're allowed to be fairly jagged. So, um, so diffusions actually have continuous but non-differentiable sample paths. And we're going to assume that. So um, this is a common assumption. <laughs> this is uh, basically got its start here at MIT. And um, I'd say diffusions were first used in a finance context back in 1965 when both Samuelson and McKean were here. <laughs> so McKean is a probabilist who's now at NYU where I teach. And um, he's still active. And um, anyway. Uh, Diffusions are widely used, so they, they really got a big boost in 1973 when Black, Scholes, and Merton, who were all here, uh, used the diffusion to describe the price of a stock underlying an option. And um, the, since then, they've just been used extensively in finance. So um, Merton, who's here, really, um, I'd say, pioneered the use of them in finance. So. Um, <coughs> Okay, so, um, okay. Well, so, um, so there's this, this uncertainty X <laughs> is probably mysterious to you, hence the name X. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so it, it's like you get to choose what it is, is kind of the idea. So this is theory, and um, it's not trying to be overly specific so that you can apply it in different contexts. And, um, but you'd like to know at least some examples, I'm sure. So one example would be X is the, S is the level of S&P 500. A different example would be X is, a sh is, is actually an interest rate. OK, so um, let's say the benchmark 30-year yield. Um, it could in X could instead be a shorter term interest rate, something called OIS, overnight index uh, swap, is, um, is a, is a possible choice for X. And um, let's say when I apply the rest of the stuff, that's how I choose X as a short interest rate, a short term interest rate. So um, so let's say, so in general, let's say I developed a theory that says the short rate is some function of X. And when I actually apply it, the function is the identity map. So um, OK. so. <coughs> So anyway, the, um, the mathematics says that, <clears throat> OK, so if there's no arbitrage, then there exists, as we're assuming, then there exists this so-called risk-neutral probability measure that I talked about earlier and um, denoted by Q. It's related but not equal to the area of risk security prices. So the, if you were to just imagine that instead of buying these area of risk security prices in a spot market, if you instead bought them in a forward market where you actually pay when they mature, uh, then those air debris security prices in the forward market would be Q. Okay, so Q and A are really close. Uh, so A, the measure A need not integrate to one, and that's just, just due to time value of money, and that's because you're paying in the spot market. If you're actually paying in the forward market, then you don't have to worry about time value of money. And so then uh, the measure Q does integrate to 1. So that's why we call it a probability measure. 
<coughs> okay, and un under this probability measure Q, the expected return on all assets is the risk-free rate. So that's what that actually says, although <laughs> you're probably not seeing that this is literally the expected return. Well, it's more precisely, it's expected price change. So the expected price change is that, what that means. So it says the expected price change is equal to risk-free rate times the price. That's what that says. So, so if you divide both sides by the spot price when it's positive, then you'll get that the expected return is equal to risk-free rate. And uh, we're doing things in continuous time here. So we're working with diffusions. And um, you may or may not have been introduced to diffusions at this stage in your mathematical career. But mathematically, one way to describe diffusions is via the, the infinitesimal generator. So um, this is a differential operator that's um, first order in time and second order in space. And let's just say this is formally how mathematicians think about this type of thing. And so this is what I've drawn here is a single sample path of the diffusion. There's definitely the possibility of other sample paths. There's actually an infinite number of paths, but they're all continuous and infinitely non. They're continuous and nowhere differentiable. So, um, <coughs> okay. Now, um, the um, I think. Okay. So. So. Um, <coughs> I want to just kind of give you a flavor of how you change numeraires. And um, so we've started with the numeraire being the money market account, this guy. And the idea is we're going to switch to a different numeraire. Uh, and so um, what'll ha what we're mainly interested in figuring out is what are the drifts of assets when we uh, when we measure them, we measure their, uh, their values in a different numeraire. So I'll kind of give you a sense of what this is about. So, so you could hold IBM, and um, every time you get a gain, you can put that gain in your local bank, Chase, and see uh, how fast your bank balance grows as you're putting all your gains in IBM in the bank. And you'll get a certain growth rate um, from that strategy. Now, you could try a different strategy where you take your gains from IBM and you actually ship them off over to a British bank, okay, which is nominated in pounds, and uh, see how fast that bank balance grows. And there's no reason that the two bank balances, the American one and the British one, need to grow at the same rate because they're denominated in different currencies. So, um, so we're basically interested to know, given that we know how fast, let's say, the American bank balance would grow, we want to know how fast the British bank balance would grow. And what affects the growth rate of the British bank balance is the covariance, actually, between the dollar-pound exchange rate and IBM. OK, so, so remember, we're investing in IBM, and we're putting gains in either an American bank or a British bank. So IBM stock price is in dollars. And so there's no issues with putting IBM's gains in an American bank. Uh, but there's actually a subtle effect that happens when you put IBM's gains in a British bank, which the subtle effect is there's this random exchange rate, dollars per pound. And um, suppose that there's some correlation between, for whatever reason, between um, dollars per pound and IBM. Okay. So suppose the correlation is the following form. Uh, every time IBM goes up, the dollar gets weaker against the pound. So, um, so that, in other words, what happens is IBM goes up, and you go, hooray, I'm rich. Uh, I got all these dollars. I'm going to go um, put them in a British bank account. So then um, the, um, but suppose, unluckily for you, every time IBM goes up, the dollar weakens against the pound. And so um, you can't buy so many. You cannot buy so many pounds uh, as a result. Okay, so um, so contrast that with the opposite situation where, when IBM goes up, the dollar strengthens as opposed to weakens. Okay, then you can buy lots and lots of pounds with your IBM gains. So so those um, so the correlation between the dollar pound exchange rate and IBM affects how fast your British bank balance would grow, and um, that's actually like the key point. 
So, so what um, is going to happen here? So this would be well known to anybody who's you know especially an FX quant, and uh, and so um, so what we're actually going to do is um, is find a numerator such that the growth rate of the balance in that numerator is the real world is actually the real world drift of the underlying. Okay, so um, so the idea is. Let's say that like I told you at the beginning of this talk that historically stocks grow at 9% on average, okay? And um, that the, the, our starting point here in this part of the talk is that we're, we're starting from uh, this risk-neutral measure Q, which by definition is the property that stocks would grow only at 1%. So, um, so what we're actually going to do is go find some numerator which will be correlated with the stocks such that when we um, put when we put our stock gains in that numerator we end up growing at nine percent rather than one percent okay so <clears throat> so that's the that's kind of the the way we think about things <clears throat> and the key is to find that numerator that has that property. So there's a paper by John Long. I'm going to go fast now. There's a paper by John Long where he shows that that, that numerator that converts a risk-free growth rate into the real-world growth rate always exists. And he gave it a name, and he called it the numerator portfolio. It has another name, growth optimal portfolio, that Kelly was talking about. And um, so... Um, so anyway, so that's, um, so there's, you know, a reference if you're interested in following up on, on this, on this material. So, um, so the, um, the theory says that there always exists this numerator called John Long's numerator portfolio such that if you park your gains in this numerator, you end up growing at the real world drift. And um, so let's say all we got to do to find that real world drift is go find this numerator, okay, the special numerator. And so this part of the talk is about making some assumptions that lead to an identification of that particular numerator, John Long's numerator. So, um, so the, um, we're going to continue to work with the fusions. And now we're going to um, also impose time homogeneity like Ross was doing. So let's say when I was just talking about numerators, I was allowing time inhomogeneity. But now uh, we're going to go time homogeneous. So, so I haven't really been introducing the notation, but AXT is the diffusion coefficient of the state variable x. And now it's just being assumed to be a function of x only. So BQXT was the drift coefficient of x, and now it's a function of x only. RXT was a function linking the short interest rate to the state variable x, and now it's a function of x only. And finally, sigma LXT was the volatility of John Long's numerator portfolio, and again, that's a function of x only. So, so anyway, another assumption that we're going to impose now in order to determine this uniquely what this numerator portfolio value is is to require that the diffusion that's driving everything live in a bounded interval. So essentially, you know, the uh, sample paths all have to be bounded below by some constant, which could be negative, and have to be bounded above by some constant, which again could be negative. Okay, so, and um, so then um, we make all those assumptions and we move on. And so in the end, what have we been assuming? So we're assuming that there's a single source of uncertainty, x, and that it's a time homogeneous diffusion. So that's this middle equation here. And so that says changes in x have a predictable part, which is bqx dt, and they have an unpredictable part, which is a of x dw. So w there is standard Brownian motion. Uh, and since you know, I'm big on mnemonics, 
you might ask, why does W stand for standard random motion? And that's because W actually stands for Wiener process, <laughs> Norbert Wiener being an MIT mathematician. <laughs> OK, so, um, so anyway, uh, and, and W is a standard notation for this kind of thing. So <clears throat> as an aside, when Bob Merton was here working out all this stuff for the first time in the late 60s, uh, he knew the standard notation for standard branding motion was W, but it turns out in finance, the standard notation for wealth is also W. And so, and he wanted to work on stochastic wealth dynamics, and so he had to choose, should I use the letter W for wealth, or should I use the letter W for Wiener process? And he chose W for wealth, which meant he had to pick a different letter for Wiener process, and so he actually chose the letter Z. And so, uh, so, and don't ask, you'll have to ask him why he chose that letter, because it doesn't stand for anything as far as I know. <laughs> Except that actually the sample paths of a Wiener process, they look they're very jagged. And so if you turn your head, you might be able to see a Z. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, another, assumption is that we're going to restrict the possible dynamics of the numerator portfolio's value. So we're going to let L denote the value of this numerator portfolio. And the mnemonic here is that John Long uh, in invented this concept, so we're calling L for Long. Now, it's unfortunate that the inventor of this concept was named Long, actually, because uh, in finance, the word Long indicates that you, you know, that you're, you're Okay, for a, non, for, for a security with a non-negative payoff, if you're long, then you're going to be receiving that payoff, okay? As you pay money now and you receive that payoff. It's the opposite of short, where if you're short a security with a non-negative payoff, then actually you get money now and you have to deliver that payoff later. So, um, so as it happens, this numerator portfolio, it has you know, multiple positions in it. And the signs of the positions are allowed to be real, so positives and negatives. So, um, so it's a kind of a misnomer. Uh, I say Long's numerator portfolio, and everyone thinks the positions in them are all positive. <laughs> okay, it's not true. So the real value. So anyway, and um, so the setting, the the kind of problem here is that we've put the structure on the value L of John Long's numerator portfolio, namely that L is a diffusion um, in well, well, let me rephrase that. L is a continuous process, and um, let's say, um, but the um, it's not quite a diffusion in itself. It's um, the only thing you can say is that the pair x and L are a bivariate diffusion, because the coefficients. If you bring this L over the other side, you can see the coefficients for dL depend on L and x, and same thing with the volatility part. So anyway, um, we place the structure, and the idea is that we know from looking at Bloomberg what the Riesz-Nutter drift of x is. That's bqx. We know that function. We know what the diffusion coefficient of x is. That's the function a of x. We know what the Riesz-Nutter drift of l is. That's that function r of x. But we don't know the volatility of John Long's numerator portfolio. That's the function sigma l of x. And if only we could find it, we would actually know how to determine the real world drift. And like, remember going, I was going back to, remember I was saying, if IBM and you were, could put it in an American bank account, and uh, let's say there was a certain growth rate there, and then if instead you were putting those gains in a British bank account, you'd achieve a different growth rate. And I was stressing that the correlation of um, of dollar pound with IBM was important for determining that growth rate. And I stand by that. Um, when you're in a one-factor world, that correlation can only be one. And um, so that's what's happening here. We're in a one-factor world, and that correlation is one. And um, the, um, the other thing that affects the growth rate, though, of your British bank account balance is actually the volatility of the exchange rate. So what actually matters is the covariance between the British exchange rate and IBM. That covariance depends on both the correlation and the volatility of the FX rate. So you can think of the FX rate as here John Long's numerator portfolio. And so that sigma L is um, sort of the key. 
So it's like we set things up so we know the correlation, but we still don't know the covariance. And that's what's actually relevant. So as soon as we get the sigma L, we'll know the covariance. And um, so we'll be in shape. OK, so, so we've got to find that volatility uh, function, sigma L. And now I know many of you have classes, so I'm going to have to start moving. No, so, Peter, yeah. people will have access to these slides afterwards. Yes. And so I'm just thinking we've got another 15 slides left. Yes. Well, actually, you'll be good, glad to know that five of those are disclaimers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, yeah, yeah, if I could move along. To, no, but pointers yeah. to what you know, are the keys towards the end? Right, yes, you know, yes, absolutely. We're very close. Okay, so I'll be done in two minutes. Okay, so um, so basically, where we are now is uh, we're going to make one more assumption that the value of John Long's new portfolio is a function of x and t. Okay, then let's say we've made all our assumptions, and where it goes is that uh, the assumptions imply that this value function splits into a, an unknown positive function of x and an unknown positive function of time. And um, when you kind of further analyze, you find that the unknown function of time is an exponential function of time. And the unknown function of x solves an ordinary differential equation uh, with, uh, of this kind. So this is called a Sturm-Louisville problem. And um, it turns out that um, Sturm and Louisville were the only mathematicians I mentioned in this talk who were not at MIT. <laughs> and uh, they uh, actually solved this problem. <laughs> or made, yeah, and um, one of the things they show is that when you're searching for functions pi and scalars lambda that solve this problem, there's only one solution that um, get, delivers you a positive function pi. And so this is how you get uniqueness. So this is the same. Remember I was saying we're back with 11. So we're searching for like a 10 vector and a scalar. Now the 10 vector is a function, and that function is pi. OK, and the scalar is lambda. So, so anyway, so the point is, is that the math implies there's a unique solution to the problem. So we learn the volatility of the numerator portfolio in the end, and then we learn the drift of everything you want to know under the market's beliefs. And so that's the, the gist of it. Um, so then there's been work on trying to extend to unbounded intervals. And basically, in the famous Black-Scholes model, this uh, effort fails. Whereas in the less famous but still important cox or sal ross model, this effort succeeds. So the sort of punchline is that when it comes to unbounded state space, the theory is open. So uh, if there's a grad student in the room who wants a good dissertation problem, this is it. OK, so, uh, so that's all I wanted to say today. Thanks. Okay. <coughs>